Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Can't Stop Thinking, How to Let Go of Anxiety and Free Yourself from Obsessive Rumination, by Nancy Collier, forward by Stephen Bodian, narrated by Kitty Hendricks. Publisher's Note this publication is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is sold with the understanding that the publisher is not engaged in rendering psychological, financial, legal, or other professional services. If expert assistance or counseling is needed, the services of a competent professional should be sought. Forward I can still remember the day I realized that my thinking was driving me crazy. As an aspiring academic in college, I believed in the value of the mind to create realms of complex thought that could solve all humanity's problems. But in my own life, I had no control over my own thoughts, and I found myself obsessing about a new relationship to the point that I was so anxious I could barely eat or sleep. Did she or didn't she? Would she or wouldn't she? The doubts and negative scenarios my mind churned out had sucked all the joy out of life. So I finally did what I had contemplated doing for years, since I had begun studying the spiritual traditions of the East as a freshman. I took a subway downtown to a traditional Zen center and embarked on the practice of meditation. Little did I suspect at the time that this was the beginning of a lifelong dedication to the spiritual life, and to discovering how we can free ourselves from suffering, and live happy, peaceful, awakened lives. It took me years of following my breath and watching my thoughts as a good Zen student to gradually gain a little distance from the obsessive ruminating that plagued me. In those days there were no shortcuts— no readily available guidebooks on the nature of the mind. No one to say simply, Look, snap out of it. You're not your thoughts. In other words, no books like this one. For Can't Stop Thinking distills a lifetime of wisdom gleaned from the author's own meditation experience, her teaching of others, and her decades of counseling clients on working with the mind into a concise how-to manual for disidentifying from your thoughts and finding peace and contentment in the present moment without years of meditation. As Collier suggests, we're addicted to our thinking, and we believe we can't enjoy life without identifying with the endless stories the mind churns out. Indeed, we take this complex narrative to be who we really are, the truth of our being as a separate self and we're afraid of what life might be like without it. Sure, we may be suffering mightily, but we firmly believe that the suffering is an inevitable result of what's happening outside of us, what others are doing to us, what life is imposing upon us, rather than seeing it as optional and within our power to regulate. We may even have an allegiance to our suffering because we believe we need to atone for the mistakes we've made shoulder the legacy of family pain, and learn the lesson it's trying to teach us. Collier invites us to kick this addiction and forswear this allegiance by taking a single radical step in a new direction. Instead of blaming circumstances out there, over which, after all, we have very little control, we can turn the finger back upon ourselves and realize that the source of our suffering lies within, in the judgments we make the stories we perpetuate, the interpretations we project. Life is the way it is, not always pleasing or painless, but we can choose how we respond to it. And the most radical, freeing step of all is to recognize that you are not the content of your thoughts. You are the awareness in which these thoughts arise and pass away. This realization is the first step on the path of awakening from the dream of separation, what the spiritual traditions call enlightenment. For the past forty years, I've been guiding seekers on the journey of awakening, and this first step, 
is always the most powerful and life-transforming. You are not your thoughts. What an extraordinary insight. When you see this once and for all, you've opened a doorway to a whole new way of being, one that offers the promise of peace, happiness, and fulfillment that can't be shaken by the ups and downs of life. Can't stop thinking, lead you by the hand through this door. And beyond. Stephen Bodian Licensed Psychotherapist Spiritual Teacher Founder and Director of the School for Awakening and Author of Meditation for Dummies Wake Up Now and Beyond Mindfulness Introduction Addicted to Thinking It was a magnificent spring morning, and I was walking in the park near my home. Well, that's not really true. I was walking, yes, but not exactly in the park. I was oblivious to the colorful flowers blooming, the warm sunshine, the smell of cut grass. I was missing all of it, having disappeared inside my own head, into my personal prison, thinking. No matter how delicious that May day may have been, I wasn't experiencing it. I was trapped inside my mind, obsessing about what was not working in my life, replaying and rethinking the same problems I'd been replaying and rethinking for years. I was down the rabbit hole of thought. And then something remarkable happened. My inner lens spun on its axis. Instead of being inside my thoughts, I was now the one looking at and listening to my thoughts. I was now the one the thoughts were talking to. I could see in the brightest technicolor what I was choosing to pay attention to. I was suddenly watching my attention attached to this toxic content, watching it latch onto and lather up my discontent. I felt the insidiousness of my thoughts and a kind of bewilderment and horror at my own inclination toward them. I experienced my thinking as something I was actually doing to myself. In that moment, I could see that I was the one replaying the same stories of discontent, conducting the same resentful conversations in my head, with the same results. Suffering. My suffering. At last, I could really hear my thoughts, distinctly, and recognize how bad they made me feel. I observed my negative thoughts for what they were, a kind of self-administered poison. Then the aha moment arrived. It dawned on me that I could do this differently, this whole life thing. I could change what I was paying attention to, turn away from the source of my suffering, not just intellectually, but at a deep bodily level, I knew that I was creating my experience and therefore I had the power to change it. If I was willing to transform the way I related to my thoughts, I could create a radically different kind of life for myself. Simultaneously, it became clear that no amount of thinking and none of my brilliant thoughts were actually going to solve the problem I was ruminating on. My thinking mind had met its match. I couldn't solve this particular problem. Not with more thought, anyway. Whatever I wanted to get, wherever I wanted to get to, if it was going to happen, it was not going to happen through more thinking. I got it. Thinking was not going to bring me the happiness or peace I had hoped it would. That moment arrived after a lifetime of narrating, analyzing, and making sense of my own and everyone else's experience all to an audience of one, me. Ruminating on what was bothering me, obsessing about how to fix it, and describing my experience to myself over and over again. It came after years spent constructing sophisticated mental narratives on why what was happening in my life was happening and what I needed to do to change it. The clarity came after far too much time spent justifying and defending why I was right, 
and right to have the experience I was having, defending all this in the court of my mind. The awakening I experienced came after a lifetime of, essentially, fighting with and trying to control reality inside my own head. On that day in the park, I discovered a new lens through which to see my life, and with it, a new identity. I had not previously known any way to experience life other than through my thoughts, as the thinker. There was no witness, no me, other than the one who was thinking. I was collapsed into the thoughts appearing in my mind. Like most people, too, I had spent my life trusting that I could think my way into a state of happiness and inner peace that more and better thinking was the solution to all the difficulties life presented. I had believed that if I worked hard enough, muscled my way through enough mental gymnastics, I could figure out whatever was not right with my world. And once I figured it out, I could fix it. Normal, but not okay. For more than 25 years as a psychotherapist, I've been listening to people talk about their lives. Every kind of problem, situation, history, and personality has walked through my office door. While the contents of our problems and situations may appear in different forms and levels of intensity, there's really one universal problem at the root of all other problems. At the core, our stress, anxiety, and chronic discontent are caused by one thing, the way we relate to our thoughts. It's our relationship with thought that makes us suffer. Jane is in a bad marriage. She spends her days and nights and sessions with me thinking about what's wrong with her husband and why he's so unlikable. Obsessively, she explains the reasons for her anger, the justifications for why she's right to feel how she feels. She explains all this to herself and anyone who will listen. When she's not ruminating on her resentment, Jane is obsessing on her own faults, blaming herself for staying in a bad marriage, for not being the feminist who would leave. She is trapped inside a repetitive, negative thought loop. She goes to work, takes care of her family, and looks healthy on the outside, like someone living a good life. She has moments of joy. On the inside, however, she feels anxious, agitated, and held hostage by her own thoughts. Allison is a new mother who's just returned to work from maternity leave. Every moment she's away from her son, she thinks about the thousands of terrible things that could happen to her child. Terrorist attacks, SIDS, choking on a Cheerio, and on and on. Sometimes she calls me in the middle of the day when her thoughts turn to panic. When her mind is not generating death scenarios, she shifts to thinking about the devastation she will feel when the terrible thing happens, how she won't be able to survive it. When she manages to pull her attention away from this imagined horror, she thinks about how despicable she is as an absent mom about how angry she is at her husband for not making enough money to let her stay home with her child, and endless other resentful thoughts. She thinks excessively and obsessively about the very things that torture and terrify her. Finally, let's consider Ken, who believed he was going to become president of the company he worked for. Unexpectedly, he was let go and has been out of work for nearly a year. Since his removal, Ken has been incessantly thinking about what he did wrong that got him fired, replaying the possible missteps he took along the way, down to the photographs he kept on his desk. He asks me every week why I think he got fired. When he's not ruminating on his professional mistakes, he's thinking about his personal failures, and specifically how ridiculous and deluded he was for imagining he could be somebody important. Ken's thoughts, like many people's thoughts, remind him, day after day, of what he isn't. While these individuals may sound like extreme examples of excessive thinking 
or what we sometimes call overthinking. They're actually quite typical of the reality many people live on a daily basis. Excessively and relentlessly is how we think. Most of us are not thinking about unicorns or rainbows either. We're thinking about the things that make us feel the worst. We feel compelled to think about what hurts, and so we suffer. If you can't stop thinking even when you want to, you're not alone. Like any other addiction. It may sound ridiculous, disrespectful, or absurd to compare the process of thinking, something so utterly natural, productive, and important, to something so dangerous, destructive, and out of control as addiction. A friend, upon hearing the topic of this book, raised her voice to say, Thinking is not like shooting drugs or drinking. Human beings think. That's what we do. Thinking is inarguably useful, necessary, creative, and miraculous. It's what distinguishes human beings from other species. The ability to think is a good thing. Thinking is the source of invention, imagination, problem-solving, and organization, to say nothing of putting together a grocery shopping list. So, I am not suggesting that we give up thinking. We couldn't even if we wanted to. This is not an anti-thinking book, or a how-to on living a lobotomized life. In fact, I'm delighted to be thinking right now as I write these words. Thinking itself, this natural ability of the mind, is not what causes us to suffer. Thoughts themselves are not inherently problematic. What's problematic is our belief that thoughts require being thought about. What causes us to suffer is our identification with thoughts, the belief that we are our thoughts. This is the real issue, and precisely what makes it so difficult for us to disentangle from thoughts and find freedom inside our own mind, our own life. Are you addicted? If you ask most people casually if they are addicted to thinking, they will say yes. But if you ask people whether thinking is an addiction, the same people will balk and deny it. Our response to the question, when we don't think about it too much, when we answer from the gut, is very different than when we pose the question to the mind, whose job not coincidentally, is to make thoughts. Do you find it hard to stop thinking about certain things, even when you absolutely want to stop thinking about them? Do you feel like your thoughts control your attention and mood? You're probably addicted to thinking, which means you're normal. And yes, you can be addicted to something that's natural and good for you. Can be addicted to an activity that you enjoy and benefit from can be addicted to something you can't live without. While your thinking addiction may not cost you your job or land you in rehab, nonetheless, your behavior is similar, with results that are similarly redundant, destructive, and painful. To start, let's consider the aspects of addiction discussed in the American Psychiatric Association's most recent Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. DSM-5, the Bible of sorts for all things psychological, and apply them to thinking as an addiction. Ask yourself, does thinking sometimes negatively impact my overall well-being? Has thinking created problems in my relationships? Have work or home responsibilities been neglected because of thinking? When I notice that I haven't been thinking, do I experience fear or anxiety or a sudden excess of thinking? Do I find myself thinking more and spending longer stretches of time thinking? Have I tried to cut back on my thinking but not been able to make it happen? Do I spend a lot of time thinking? Has my thinking led to physical or psychological health problems, anxiety or depression? 
Have I cut down on or stopped doing activities I once enjoyed in order to spend more time thinking? Do I ever look forward to or crave thinking? If you are like most people, you answered yes to six or seven of these questions. Every person I've ever interviewed, without exception, has said that their thinking, in one way or another, creates problems in their life and disrupts their overall well-being. Whether it's from too much thinking or the content of what you're thinking about, excessive thinking causes problems in our relationships, work, health, quality of life, and overall well-being. Thinking is like any other addiction except for the fact that we don't think it's an addiction, and also for the fact that we take breaks between our drink, drug, and food binges, but we don't when it comes to our thinking. We devote ourselves to thinking without pause, from the cradle to the grave. Remarkably, no matter how much we suffer as a result of our thinking, we keep at it with the same resolute faith that thinking will provide the solution to whatever ails us. We continue doing what we've always done, despite inarguable proof that much of our thinking is not productive and actually makes us more anxious, stressed, and unhappy. We keep doing the very thing that harms us, while hoping for and believing in a different result. We do what we've always done and get what we've always gotten. Where, oh, where is the off button? There's no off button, is how many people describe their relationship with addictive thinking. Once we start thinking about a problem or situation, we're unable to pull ourselves away from it. We descend into the rabbit hole, even though we don't want to go in there, even though we're aware that the thinking itself is what's making us unhappy. As Jane lamented, there are times I am literally asking myself, as I am thinking, why am I still thinking about this? I want to stop. Why can't I stop? But I just keep at it. It can be astoundingly difficult to pull our attention away from negative thought loops. We are physically, mentally, and emotionally hooked, intensely resistant to the idea of letting go of the thoughts, no matter how much pain they're creating or how much we hate thinking about them. We are at war with our thoughts and ourselves at the same time. The obsessive thoughts feel dreadful, but if we dare turn our attention away from them, we experience a fierce backlash that can feel almost worse than the thoughts themselves. While strange, it seems as if we, at some level, actually enjoy, benefit from, or feel empowered by the negative thoughts. For sure, we are attached to them and unwilling to let go. Usually, we keep thinking until we're forced to turn our attention to something else that can't wait. A crying child, a burning pot, or until we go unconscious, either through sleep or self-medication, which, sadly, is the solution many people are choosing these days. In order to stop the cacophonous noise in our head, we have to anesthetize our thoughts and ourselves in the process. We use external substances to relieve our addiction to this overpowering substance called thought. And yet, it is apparent that the word addicted is also misused, misunderstood, and thrown around with far too much levity. Addicted has become a trendy way of describing any behavior we think we overdo or even enjoy. I'm addicted to gummy bears. I'm addicted to Netflix. I'm addicted to spin class. There's nothing light or enjoyable about real addiction. I do not use the metaphor of addiction without deep respect for the reality of it. Thinking can indeed lead us down its own path of self-destruction, a destruction we live privately, in the confines of our own mind and sometimes without the visible or obvious consequences that often lead us to seek help. Who's in charge? We must remember this. When thoughts happen, and what they're about, are not in our control. 
The mind produces thoughts like the heart pumps blood, or the pancreas generates insulin. It's what the mind does, its job. Thoughts form in mysterious ways in the recesses of our consciousness and seem to appear out of the ether. They certainly don't ask our permission to enter into awareness. The reality of constant, random, and uninvited intruders appearing in our consciousness would be challenging enough. But when we compound this truth with the fact that we believe we must also engage with and make sense of each of these unvetted intruders, we end up with a much bigger challenge than just randomly appearing thoughts. We end up powerless over our own attention. As long as our attention is bouncing around at the mercy of thoughts we don't choose, we remain passengers rather than pilots in our own life. As long as our attention is out of our control, we're trapped on the thinking train, and our life, essentially, is out of our control. The Fun of It I recently asked an addict what he feared most about giving up his substance of choice, which in this case was alcohol. Without a moment's hesitation, he said that if he stopped using, he would never have fun again, never have sex again never go out with friends again, never enjoy life. His life would be utterly mediocre, joyless. Indulging, as he viewed it, was the key to excitement and a happening life. The thought of a life with less thinking is similarly perceived as empty or boring. One client described it as life without spice, bland, dull, a void. Another asked, Without thinking, why be alive? From inside our thinking addiction, we can't imagine what could make life interesting without our stories and drama, all the yummy byproducts of our thoughts. When I told people I was writing a book about our universally shared addiction to thinking, I was frequently met with a sense of outrage. That's ridiculous. How would we get anything done if we weren't thinking? Nothing is possible without thinking. Or as one friend retorted, So then I should face a blank wall and hum om for the rest of my life? Life is short. I want to be in it. Their reactions imply that, without our perpetual thinking, we will be left in some sort of vegetative state, unable to take action or do anything. It is as if the very possibility of life occurring depends upon our thinking. Exploring this topic has shown me how provocative and unwelcome the idea of doubting the veracity of our thoughts, of disidentifying with them, really is in our society. Contemplating the act of thinking as something we do, not as something we are, appears to be deeply threatening to us. Not thinking suggests a kind of death. Given the complexity of what thinking represents, we ferociously protect our relationship with it. To that end, most of us employ a sophisticated array of beliefs about why we should never and will never give up our love affair with thought, even when evidence suggests our thinking is hurting us. In truth, however, we are not to blame for our relationship with thoughts. We relate to thoughts the way we've been taught to relate to thoughts as profoundly important bits of wisdom that deserve and demand our rapt attention. We kneel at the feet of all our thoughts as if they contain the answers to all our questions. Recovery Why are there so many books written on the topic of thinking, negative thinking, overthinking, binge thinking, and all the other kinds of thinking that create stress and unhappiness and leave us feeling powerless. Why do the theories and solutions to our thinking addiction keep coming? And furthermore, why is thinking still such an epidemic problem? Most of us believe that if we could only change our bad thoughts to good ones, write enough gratitude lists, repeat enough affirmations, then we would be happy. Most of us think it's our fault that our mind overwhelms us so much. We must not be doing the right work or enough of it. But the truth is, 
it's not our fault. We don't recover from our addiction to thinking through the strategies most self-help literature advises. We don't have to like our thoughts to be free. Self-help is solving the wrong problem. Recovery from excessive thinking is not about stopping thoughts or achieving a thought-free existence. At the same time, it's not about changing what our thoughts are about, skewing our thoughts from negative to positive. Although this can be helpful, it's not the solution. Recovery happens when we change the way we interact with thoughts, the value we assign them, the belief we invest in them, and the attachment we have to them, no matter what contents or messages they contain. We recover when our allegiance shifts from being aligned with the thoughts and their content to being aligned with the one who the thoughts are talking to, or at, which is what you'll be learning more about in the sections to come. This book is here to help you build a safe shore, a refuge inside yourself, from which to see and interact with the thoughts appearing in your consciousness. My hope is that with this new awareness— you will be able to cultivate a more conscious and intentional relationship with thoughts. All this so that you can be content regardless of what the out-of-order computer in your head is spitting out at any given moment. This book is designed to show you how to break free from the compulsion to turn every thought into an occasion for thinking, to stop worshipping at the altar of your mind. My goal is not to help you find freedom from thought, but rather to find freedom with thought. Thoughts are not going away. They're not going to go away. We wouldn't want them to anyway. My purpose here is to illustrate a way to be free and autonomous, while your thoughts are firing, and most of all, to shepherd you into the well-being and peace that is inside you, and always there below the thoughts and thinking. Breaking your addiction to thinking requires falling out of love with the endless material your mind generates without your consent. This process involves a willingness to recognize what your excessive thinking is actually doing to you, the suffering you are creating for yourself, and how your thinking choices, or lack thereof, are impacting the quality of your life. The good news is that your thoughts don't need to change one iota for you to be released from them, or rather, to release yourself from them. A Good Life While we have a sophisticated educational system, oddly, we don't learn the most important skill we need to maintain a basic state of well-being. In order to create and sustain a good life, we must cultivate a conscious and constructive relationship with our own thoughts, a relationship that allows us to use thinking for the delicious benefits it offers, but that doesn't permit thinking to take over our life or wreak havoc on our experience. We have infinitely more choice than we know when it comes to our attention and what we do with it. We are not powerless when it comes to what thoughts we take a ride on, we don't have to live at the mercy of the thoughts our mind throws at us, which is positively not what our mind wants us to think. A glass of wine can be used as a lovely treat at the end of a long day, but that same substance can be used as a means to flee from our life, avoid the present moment, inflict self-harm, fulfill an obsession, or any number of destructive ends. This is true of our thinking as well. When we think without awareness, discernment, and discipline, we give up control of our life. We give away our own attention, and with it, the authority to decide our state of mind and being. Throughout this book, I will lay out the subtle and not-so-subtle consequences of excessive thinking, which, if you are old enough to be listening to this book, you have probably experienced firsthand. I'll explore the infinitely complicated conundrum that the activity of thinking presents, what it does to us when we let it control us, 
and what we can do about it. But most importantly, I'll provide the tools to build a new and empowered relationship with thoughts, one in which you are in charge, not your thoughts. In so doing, I hope to offer liberation from your universally sanctioned addiction, lasting relief from the real source of your chronic discontent. In the sections that follow, I wish to invite you into a life in which thoughts do not control the most precious asset you possess, your own attention. And furthermore, a life in which your thoughts are not the truth, and most definitely not who you are. A New Way of Living We live in a society that demands and expects immediate answers strategies to implement for life's challenges. We want relief from our suffering, understandably. And indeed, this book includes exercises to help you break free from the unending thinking that causes you to suffer. But unfortunately, you can't just think your way out of excessive thinking, or you would have been free of this addiction years ago, and your life would be radically different. Trying to think your way out of excessive thinking is a recipe for even more thinking. The best way to change your life is to change the you who's living it. When the eyes you're looking through change, what you see changes. The observed is changed by the observer. When who you are in relationship with your thoughts shifts, so too will your life experience. I encourage you to let these words soak in, to let the meaning be absorbed by your body and heart, not just your mind. It's strange what I'm asking you to do, to think about thinking and at the same time to experience these words through a different portal than just your thinking mind. I invite you to suspend judgment and resist the urge to think too much about how to not think or to think more about thinking less. Try experiencing the journey of this book in a new way, not knowing what it means immediately and just letting it wash over you. As odd as this all may sound, try not to get it all figured out too soon. Your own path to freedom from excessive thinking will emerge. For now, trust that the way you see your thoughts can shift, that you can shift in relationship with your thoughts, that your thoughts may indeed become thoughts without a thinker. My hope is that this book will be helpful for you no matter where you are in your life, whether you've never meditated or have been practicing awareness for decades. Know that this book will be more helpful if you have the courage to listen to your own experience as you go through it. And, most helpful, if you're willing to refrain from thinking it out of its helpfulness. If you picked up this title, chances are some part of you wants to ruminate less, stop catastrophizing, turn off your thoughts when you want to turn them off, have more choice in what you think about, hear less noise in your head, feel less anxious, experience more peace, or maybe all of the above. Perhaps you already know that the way you think is making you unhappy, and that changing your life will mean changing your thinking. The good news is that you're right. The even better news is that it's possible. I'll make one promise to you in this book. If you change your relationship with thinking, you will change your life. Chapter 1 Awareness, Changing Our Relationship with Thought Tara came to see me when she was in her mid-thirties. By her own account, she had devoted the last ten years of her life to conquering and eliminating her obsessive and, as she called it, unstoppable thinking. She had been devoted to self-help for a decade and tried anything and everything to convince her mind to stop talking and specifically to stop telling her she was worthless. Mostly she had used positive thinking methods, 
which included affirmations and gratitude practices. She had worked hard to change the thoughts she heard in her head. She was a self-help pickle by now, no longer a cucumber, and no going back. But here she was in my office, still struggling and stymied by her unceasing inner chatter, feeling hopeless and beaten, powerless over her thoughts and powerless over what they were doing to her. I've met hundreds of Taras, people who have been disappointed by self-help and psychological fix-it strategies. My practice is filled with folks who are unable to find lasting relief from their excessive thinking through the self-help techniques that forever beckon and promise us a new life. If you also have tried everything on the shelf, don't despair. It's not your fault that you haven't found what you need. Controlling the content of our thoughts is a temporary fix, a shiny hat over dirty hair. It works to some degree when things are running smoothly and we like what's happening in our life. But when the going gets tough and life rolls out the hard stuff, which it always does at some point, the positive thoughts don't stick. The fix-it strategies fail. And we revert back to our old belief systems and historical thinking patterns. Positive thinking can be helpful, and it feels good, but it doesn't get at the real problem. It's not strong enough to create real change in the beliefs that underlie our negative thoughts. Ultimately, it's just a band-aid on a far deeper and more powerful condition. What makes positive thinking an inadequate solution is not just its unreliability. The real reason it falls short is that it's addressing the wrong problem. When the strategy is to replace negative or unwanted thoughts with positive ones, we are relying on misguided beliefs, assuming the following. We can and should be able to control our thoughts. What our thoughts are saying is important. Our thoughts have the power to control us. And finally, we have to get our thoughts under control before we can be okay. All of which are false. Positive thinking maintains, incorrectly, that our well-being depends upon what our thoughts are saying at any moment. And thus, our successful management and control of the thoughts are the keys to our happiness. In this system, we are still at the mercy of the contents of our thoughts, still dependent on what is not ours to control. Positive thinking claims to empower us, but, at the root, it disempowers us. Self-help sells a kind of cognitive ammunition, an arsenal for winning the war against our unwanted thoughts. But if what you want is to not feel controlled by your thoughts, then the answer is to stop trying to control your thoughts. Stop trying to defeat them. What frees us from negative thinking is not winning the war against our thoughts over and over again, minute by minute, day by day, for years on end, but rather removing ourselves from the war altogether. Stepping Out for Peace of Mind so then, how do we step out of the battle? What is the strategy for surrendering the fight? The process I'm suggesting begins with a radical shift in perspective. The positive thinking system says that in order for us to be okay, our thoughts have to be okay, to our liking. This suggests that we are reliant upon our thoughts. Essentially, it says we are our thoughts. But what if this is not true? Stepping out of the battle with your thinking starts by considering that your well-being does not depend on correcting thoughts at all, and furthermore, does not depend on your liking or even agreeing with your thoughts. Have you ever noticed, when thoughts are not here, even if it's just for a moment, that you are still here, still awake, still conscious? We remain, with or without thought, which strongly suggests that we are not made of our thoughts. 
How can we still be here if what we are is not here? As you'll experience repeatedly through the exercises in this book, sometimes we can see our thoughts happening, see them actually arising and even passing. The fact that we can see our thoughts and hear what they're saying also tells us that we cannot be our thoughts. We can't be what we can see happening in front of us. It turns out that well-being depends upon our realizing that we are not our thoughts, and our thoughts are not us. Ask yourself, what if I am not my thoughts? What if I am what hears and sees the thoughts, the awareness within which thoughts are appearing? Let this possibility germinate in you. Walk with it. Sit with it. Shower with it. Eat with it. Notice what happens. Thoughts appear and disappear within our field of awareness. That much is true. We, however, are not responsible for their content. Thoughts can say what they want and will, and we can still be okay. Our thoughts stop controlling us when we cultivate a separate place inside ourselves from which to observe thoughts, and when we stop seeing it as our job to correct and conquer them. Freedom dawns through awareness, specifically the awareness to see what's happening inside your own mind as an observer, and it begins by surrendering the responsibility for controlling what you see. Awareness is observing. I discuss awareness a lot in this book, and indeed, awareness is the key to breaking free from addictive thinking. But awareness is a word we throw around to mean many things. It's also something we don't think of as a skill, but instead as something we just possess and are born with. To some degree, that's true. But in the context of this conversation, awareness is something very specific and a skill we must develop and cultivate. Awareness, as I refer to it, is the practice of creating an inner witness who can see thoughts without being identified, merged, or collapsed into them. Before you can make any choices about how you want to relate and respond to thoughts, you must develop an I or a witness who's separate from thought. You need to step back, as we can't change our relationship with something until we can see it as a something we're in relationship with. As Eckhart Tolle explains, once we can see our thoughts, we're no longer addicted. Seeing Thoughts Like Birds in the Sky When we're born, we experience life through our senses. There is seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and feeling, but not yet a me who is doing all that. Sensing is just happening. Our self, our experience, and our environment are all one thing. But as we grow and start to see and experience ourselves as a separate entity, a me with a name who shows up in the mirror and then the proverbial my tummy my candy, my wheelbarrow, my mommy, ad infinitum, we start to experience ourselves as separate from our environment. That separate me, then, over time, is conditioned to focus on the objects appearing in his or her awareness, toys, things, people, food, and so forth. Oh, look at that. Touch this. Taste that. Our attention is consumed by the thing we're pointing at. But in the process, we've lost sight of the seeing or sensing itself, the awareness that makes relationship with the object possible. We've lost contact simultaneously with the space within which the object appears. If you point at the sky and ask, What's that? Most people will tell you a bird, an airplane, a cloud, or some other object they see at that moment within the sky. But what goes unseen and unexperienced is the sky itself. We are so trained to focus on the thing appearing that we miss the infinite space, the sky within which the birds, planes, clouds, 
and all the rest come and go. Such is the case with our mind. We perceive only the thoughts, but not the awareness out of which they arise and into which they disappear. We hear only the words, but know nothing of the one who hears the words. To change your thinking, however, you must become aware of the awareness that surrounds thoughts like the sky hosting the birds. Exercise The Basics of Awareness Practice Awareness for our purposes is simply noticing what's happening, and that's it. Being able to do this is a skill that you can cultivate by practicing paying attention to this present moment, on purpose and without judgment. That is, you can become more aware of what's happening in your mind, body, environment, and everything else the present moment contains. You can notice what's here now without deciding why it's here, whether you like it, or what you need to do about it. You basically observe without getting involved in the contents or storylines being offered. When you practice awareness, you adopt an attitude of curiosity and friendliness. Your goal is to simply look without looking for anything in particular. 1. Imagine that you are pointing a camera at your mind right now. What do you hear and see? 2. Observe what's happening in there, inside your head. Are there lots of thoughts or just a few here and there? Are the thoughts distinct so you can make out the particular words or images they carry? Or are the thoughts appearing more like a background of static and noise? 3. What's the mood of the thoughts? How do the thoughts feel without going into the content? The purpose here, oddly, is not to answer these questions. These questions are just pointers or guides to help you witness your own thoughts without doing anything to change them. These inquiries are about one thing, learning to stay still and watch the movie of your own mind. When we practice awareness, sometimes referred to as mindfulness, we turn our attention inside ourselves and observe. We don't make a story about what we see, don't try to figure it out or fix it, and don't try to attain anything through it. We just look, without changing, improving, managing, or controlling what we're seeing. While it sounds quite simple, ridiculously simple even, and maybe even pointless, it is anything but easy. The most effective awareness practice, ironically, is the simplest, almost too simple for the mind to be able to understand or bear. It's a practice that purposefully starves the mind of its usual diet of strategies and improvement plans, homework assignments, lists, and things to do. Things the mind can busy itself with. Awareness practice is absent the strategizing our mind relishes and without the mental gymnastics to which we are accustomed. The mind gets squirrely with so little instruction, so little to do. It wants to get busy judging story-making, and planning to change what it sees. But we do our best to stay still and just look. The practice is one of observation as its own destination, to take the seat of the witness in and to your own mind. It's as if you set up a camera and point it at your mind, but then walk away from the camera as it films the field in front of it. The filming is happening, but you are not there to judge, interpret, or edit it. It's like the French style of truthful cinema, or cinema verite, with the subject being our own consciousness. What I have described is awareness practice in its purest form, just looking at your thoughts and being curious and friendly. If you are new to awareness practice, however, it may feel impossible to just look at what's happening inside your mind without any agenda or strategy and without any plan for what your mind should do with it. That's okay. If you try it, but still feel it's impossible to be without an intention other than to observe, you can give your mind something to pay attention to. 
a way to busy itself while you practice not being your thoughts. Exercise Resting attention on an object In awareness practice, the breath can be used as an object of attention, an activity of sorts for your mind, a bit like throwing a puppy a sock to chew so she stops crawling all over you. The breath works so well not because it holds any important or mystical qualities, but simply because it's always here and always available as a doorway into now. The practice is this. Focus your attention on the sensation of the breath, whether at the nostril, chest, or belly, wherever it is most distinct. Where you notice the breath is not important. Notice and feel the inhalation and exhalation and the subtle pauses between them. Do this even as your thoughts are coming and going and beckoning like mad for your attention. As you sit and pay attention to your breath and simultaneously resist the urge to get involved with the content of your thoughts to go on the rides they offer, you are cultivating a you that is not made of thought a you that can decide whether or not you want to engage with thought. 1. Close your eyes and take a deep breath. 2. Place your hand on your abdomen and take another breath, paying attention to the sensation of your abdomen rising and falling. 3. Bring your attention inside your body and notice any sensations present. 4. Now let your attention rest on your breath. Feel the sensation of the breath, wherever it's most distinct. 5. There's nothing to do, nothing to control or change in any way. You're simply noticing and feeling the cessation of the body breathing itself. Keep your attention on the individual breaths, one at a time. 6. When sensations arise, notice the sensations, but keep your attention resting on the breath. When thoughts arise, notice the thoughts without getting involved in them and without judging yourself or the thoughts. Keep your attention on the breath. 7. If you notice you've trailed off into thought, notice that you've been absent and, once again, return your attention to the breath. Don't judge yourself for thinking. Just come back to the next breath. 8. Continue this practice for 10 minutes if you can. You may have to return your attention to the breath a hundred times in these 10 minutes, and that's normal. Every time you realize that you've been lost in thought, not present, celebrate the fact that you woke up and became aware of your own absence. As you stay with the breath and notice the thoughts arising without getting involved with them, you are building the muscle of awareness, disentangling yourself from thoughts, de-identifying from the contents of your mind. And with time and practice, you start to experience yourself as the awareness to and within which the thoughts are occurring, rather than as the thoughts themselves. When you sit down to practice mindfulness, what's important is not what you find in your mind when you observe it, no matter how interesting or revolutionary it may be to you. An astrophysicist once shared that a scientific breakthrough had appeared to him in a meditation session. He experienced an epiphany that would change our understanding of the universe. But the mindfulness teacher responded with a wave of his hand utterly disinterested in his findings. He reminded the scientist not to attach to or celebrate what was appearing in his consciousness, the contents of mind, but rather to just look and notice what was doing the looking, the awareness. This is an act of curiosity about your own consciousness, not about the material that you discover there. You stay anchored to the breath as you notice the movements of mind. 
The idea behind this kind of practice is to observe your mind from a place that is not thought. Rather than seeing from your thoughts, you are looking at your thoughts, from the awareness that notices them, but is not of them. Establishing a Regular Practice The most important thing about awareness practice is that you do it, and do it consistently. If you really want to break free from being controlled by your thoughts, I suggest a regular, daily if possible, practice. Remember, as many years as you've been alive is how many years you've been feeding your addiction to thought, taking every thought to heart, and believing that you are your thoughts. It takes time and practice to peel yourself and your identity away from thoughts, to have the awareness muscle it takes to really look at them, and yet not be seduced by them. Thoughts are seductive. That's just true. Consistency and commitment to our practice are therefore necessary in order to build the strength and presence it takes to resist their seduction. If you can, Spend a minimum of ten minutes each day practicing this kind of mindfulness, just paying attention to what's arising in your field of awareness, thoughts, and sensations. If you can do twenty or thirty minutes, even better. If you can only eke out five minutes on a day, practice for five minutes. This is not a competition, not an all-or-nothing thing. Whatever time you can devote to awareness is beneficial, and time well spent. You can do it on a chair, meditation cushion, yoga mat, or sofa. Sitting up straight, in a good posture, can help formalize and deepen your practice. But it's not what's important. What's important is that you practice, period. So, too, you can practice awareness anywhere, on the subway at your desk, in a restaurant. Your location is irrelevant. And in fact, the minutes you practice don't even have to happen all in a row. If you just can't get ten minutes in sequence, which is its own problem you might want to address, then take a couple minutes here and there to stop what you're doing and turn the lens of awareness around so it's pointing at your own mind. It's helpful, as well, to practice awareness in a more general style. Without any formality, you can just keep an eye out for what your thoughts are up to and how they're affecting you. Non-Judgmental Seeing Awareness can also be developed through the practice of non-judgmental seeing. Our thoughts are made up of opinions, likes and dislikes, interpretations, analyses, and judgments. The practice of non-judgmental seeing, on the other hand, is the exercise of experiencing life, even if it's just for a moment here or there, without adding our opinions and judgments onto what we're experiencing. If it sounds radical, it's because it is. That's the complete opposite of the way most of us normally live. In non-judgmental seeing, we practice being in the present moment, without supplementing it with our thoughts about what's happening. Our experience simply happens, and we refrain from formulating a set of ideas about it, what it means, and all the rest. We live it without the whole commentary that usually accompanies it. Exercise Non-Judgmental Seeing While it may sound inconceivable to live without constant opinions— the practice of non-judgment is actually not that hard to get the hang of. However, it can feel very strange when we first start, given the fact that we've spent our entire lives formulating thoughts and opinions about, well, everything. 1. Close your eyes and take a deep breath through your nose. Bring the air all the way down into your belly. Hold the inhalation and then breathe out a long, slow exhalation through your mouth. Hold the exhalation. Do this a few times, or more if you'd like. 2. Scan through your body, 
and notice whether there are any places of constriction or tension. Offer these places an invitation to relax and release what they're holding. Take your time. 3. Now, open your eyes and look around the room. See what you're seeing, but refrain from internally commenting on it. Don't name what you're seeing, decide whether you like it, decide what needs to be done about it, or do anything else for that matter. Just look. Take in what's in the space without language and without knowing anything about it. 4. Notice what this experiment evokes in you. Without our opinions added on, life feels different. Still rich, but just different. Through this practice of non-judgmental seeing, we start to taste a way of experiencing life that's not defined by judgment and commentary. You might say, not live through our thoughts. When we give ourselves permission to live without having to come up with a narrative or an opinion on what we're living, our addiction to thinking naturally eases. As a result, we end up feeling profound freedom and the deepest relief. No matter what's happening in your day, you can always stop for a moment and observe the kinds of thoughts passing through awareness. You can maintain a certain level of attention, all the time, to how your thoughts are impacting you. Awareness practice is more than just something you do. It's a way of being with yourself, and indeed, a way of living. This shift in attention lived and practiced regularly, will deliver profound results and, ultimately, free you from chronic discontent. As you move through this book, you will find a host of awareness practices, as well as deepening tools for common thinking patterns and conundrums. Beneath all awareness practice is the intention to break free from our attachment to thought and to know ourselves as more than just thought. Awareness is the simplest practice we will ever do, and also the most powerful. Why not start today?